So uh, Dr. Ellen Wong is going to come and share with us on where happiness comes from. Uh, she's from the great state of Toronto. That's not a state, city. <laughs> Toronto, right? Toronto. Uh, she's really nice and traveled internationally to be with us. So let's give her a warm welcome. Take a look at this ladder. You can see there's zero on the bottom, 10 on the top. If the very top step, the 10, represents the best possible life for you, and the zero on the bottom represents the worst life possible for you, which step would you place yourself on? <laughs> this exercise that you just completed is called a life evaluation and it's the main contributing factor to a country's happiness ranking in the annually published happiness report the cantrell ladder is believed to be a more accurate, more holistic way of measuring happiness than simply asking about positive and negative emotions. Because happiness is a lot more than simply emotions. There are societal factors and individual factors that will affect where you place yourself on this ladder. So for example, on a societal level, things like GDP, life expectancy at birth, freedom to make your own choices, generosity, trust in the society you live in, and trust in your government is going to affect where you place yourself on that ladder. Now on an individual level, what affects our happiness? Almost every single decision we make, whether we realize it or not. You want to build a successful business. Why? Because you want to help people, because you want to have a positive impact, because you want to be able to have the lifestyle that you want. And if you had all of that, how would you feel? Probably pretty happy. We crave close relationships because we want to share our life experiences, because we want to connect to people, because we want to love, and we want to feel loved. That also makes us pretty happy, right? We want to give back. We want to help people out. How does that help us feel? Happy. We practice gratitude. Why? So we can learn to be happy with the things we already have. The top five regrets when surveyed of people who were dying, include the following. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. And the last one, I wish I had let myself be happier. So here's the question I have. If happiness is such a fundamental human desire, then why is it that we have never been taught how to be happy? This question was never so apparent to me, never so daunting. Then about 10 years ago, I was sitting on my then boyfriend's couch in his apartment and it was not a good time in my life. My family had disowned me because I was dating said boyfriend. It meant that I was banned from my cousin's wedding. I couldn't attend any birthdays or celebrations. I had to fight my way into the hospital to see my grandmother when she had a stroke and fell down the stairs. My two best friends had also moved out of the province, one as far away as Australia. I developed two very bad coping mechanisms. One, 
I tried to find happiness through material goods. I developed a shopping addiction. I maxed out my credit cards multiple times. The second bad coping mechanism was that I devoted myself completely to work. Because if I worked all the time, I did not have to deal with any of my emotions. It also earned me praise. There was validation that I was still important and a valued human being. The really interesting thing about being in the workplace is when you're really good at doing work, you get rewarded with more work. <laughs> And so years of this led to burnout, anxiety, depression. I had panic attacks, one which got me arrested, but that is story for another time. <laughs> I also came very, very close to seriously harming myself. I was given antidepressants. I was given anti-anxiety medication. And here's the thing, they helped me. They saved my life. They got me to the point where I could do the things that as a naturopathic doctor, I knew I was supposed to be doing. Like eating well and sleeping and exercising and creating all those good lifestyle habits. Eventually, I got to the point where I started weaning off medications because I was feeling better. And I got to that final meeting with my doctor where we were gonna make a decision about whether I was going to completely stop medications altogether. And the conversation went something like this. So Ellen, you're, you're good. Like no more anxiety, no more depression. I mean, I'm not anxious and I'm not depressed. I don't, like, I don't feel good. What do you mean? You don't feel good. Like you're not anxious. You're not depressed, right? Yeah. That is true. I'm not either of those things, but I don't feel the way I want to feel. How did you think you were going to feel? I want to feel happy. I thought I would be happy by now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, you know what they say, happiness is an inside job. Let me know if you need to book another appointment to start your medications again. <laughs> I went home that day and I came to a very stark realization. And that is medications will get me from negative to neutral. But no pill will get me from neutral to positive. I don't blame the doctor for saying what he said because nowhere in med school, to my knowledge, are we taught to help someone be happy. I mean, we have a lot of things to help people not be sick. So negative to neutral, nothing from neutral to positive. So after that appointment, I thought, you know, maybe I should consult another doctor, get a second opinion. You know, I consulted a pretty, pretty famous doctor. You've all heard of them. Dr. Google. <laughs> Dr. Google, unfortunately, was not very helpful. As a matter of fact, Dr. Google was slightly irritating because here is the advice that I got. Happiness comes from within. Be positive. Focus on the good. The purpose of our lives is to be happy. Being happy is the greatest form of success. Choose happiness. Telling someone who doesn't have the tools to be happy, to just choose happiness, is like telling someone who is hungry and doesn't have food to just choose feeling full. <laughs> Speaking of food, after spending some time with Dr. Google, I was really hungry. So I went to my favorite Chinese restaurant. I ordered an entire Peking duck all to myself. I, in or I ordered a plate of stir fry clams and a plate of stir fry bok choy, veggies, all of my favorite food, all to myself. Should have seen the look I got from the server, but whatever. And as I sat there, I was really tasting the juiciness of the duck. 
and the juiciness of the clams and the crunchiness of the vegetables. And I realized that I was filled with this insatiable desire to figure out what the heck makes us happy. Because in the collective wisdom of humankind, I do not believe that this is all we could come up with. The average high school student spends 1,000 hours on algebra, geometry, and calculus. They spend exactly zero hours on learning about one of our most fundamental human desires. So thus began my journey to figuring out what makes us happy. I dove into the research. I took the happiness courses offered by professors out of Berkeley, Yale, Harvard. I asked every patient and client that I could who would indulge in my questionings. And I traveled to the happiest countries on earth because I wanted to know what made them happy. My travels took me to Bhutan beautiful country nestled in the Himalayan mountains, they developed something called the Gross National Happiness Index, and they use it to measure the happiness of its citizens. Now, this index is so powerful and so impactful that it led the UN to declare March 20th as the International Day of Happiness so that we can recognize and acknowledge the importance of happiness as a human desire for everyone around the world. When I share that I help people build the bridge between success and happiness, one objection I always hear is, Ellen, how can you possibly know what makes everyone happy? It's such an individual thing. Here's the thing about happiness. It is incredibly individual, but as human beings, we are all wired to some extent the same way. You may not like duck or clams or bok choy, but everyone needs protein and veggies. After years of leaning into this, I have summarized the facets, the cornerstones of what we need to create true happiness in our lives. I call them the nine pillars of happiness, and here they are. Health, authenticity, purpose, productivity, inner peace, nature, emotional intelligence, social connection, and sustainability. And I began to look at all of these components in all of my patients and clients as a way of assessing their happiness. I, each of these nine pillars has a set of essential questions that I would either pose or get clients to pose to themselves to measure whether that particular cornerstone was contributing to their level of happiness or not. We're not gonna go through all nine of them because I only have 30 minutes and we know we'll get kicked off the stage. So we'll cover three of the most important ones today. Health. I often have patients who will come in and ask me to run a whole slew, whole variety of lab tests to figure out their health status. Here's the thing about lab tests. They measure whether you are sick, not whether you are healthy. So after working with thousands of patients, the one question that I will still ask as a pretty good and accurate indicator of health, or I'll get them to ask themselves this, do I have the energy to do the things I want to do? Because if you can say yes, for the most part, I'm good, you're probably pretty healthy. Like it's a simple question, but it's a pretty profound one. And if you say, you know what, like, 
I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I wake up, I need my coffee, or I feel sluggish, brain fog, trouble concentrating, you know, I feel mentally drained, then there's probably something we need to look at from either a physical or a mental health perspective. The next essential question, productivity. Now, I think productivity over the last little while has gained this kind of interesting vibe to it. I don't think productivity is about doing as much as you can in the least amount of time possible. Productivity is actually about time management. Time management, interestingly, has nothing to do with managing time. Time management is about managing your priorities. It's about do you use your time towards what matters? Now in Bhutan, the, this concept, this like control of your use of time is in their gross national happiness index. And it <coughs> kind of gets lived out like this. So when my husband and I traveled there on our honeymoon, uh, we were given, a, everyone's given a guide. Um, here he is, this is his dog uh, who came with us for most of our trip. Um, you're given a guide because Bhutan is extremely protective of their ecological diversity and their environment. Like they are the only carbon negative country in the entire world. So they absorb more carbon dioxide than they emit. Right? And they want to keep it this way. So there's no Uber, there's no public transport. You can't just, you know, get a cab. You're given a guide and they, they take you around. And when we got our itinerary, there was this little paragraph on the bottom that said, it is the belief of the Bhutanese people that they should be allowed to use their time towards what matters to them. Which means in the middle of our trip, in the middle of our work day, when our guide had to go home and prepare for his daughter's birthday party, he did. Another person from the tour company stepped in and took care of us. When this person stepped in, it wasn't out of favor, right? There was no red tape, no applications for days off. There was none of that. The other person stepped in because of course you should go celebrate your daughter. That is important to you. And you should have the freedom to use your time towards what matters. And so this sense of community, the sense of trust, the sense of respect for your use of time is what I think helps the Bhutanese people find so much happiness and they're so devoted to their work. The other reason I think work can make bring a bit of joy to them is because their road signs on the way to and from work look like this. <laughs> So my essential question around productivity is this. Do I feel in control of my time and do I use it towards the things that matter? The last question I want to raise today is about inner peace. There was a group of researchers who conducted this experiment where you were given two choices. You could either choose to sit with nothing, no distractions, nothing but your own thoughts for 15 minutes, or you could choose to give yourself a little electric shock. Over two thirds of the men and over a quarter of the women chose to give themselves the shock. If our inner dialogue causes this much turmoil, how could we possibly be happy? And so my essential question around inner peace is this, how would I feel after sitting with nothing but my own thoughts for 15 minutes? If you're interested in grabbing the rest of the questions, you can scan that QR code or just come and talk to me afterwards and I'll be happy to send everything over to you. I've spent the last several years consistently 
coming back to these pillars of happiness. I use them to guide most of the decisions that I make. They are the reason why I amicably separated from that boyfriend and met and married my husband. They are the reason that despite the hurt, I have reunited with my family and I can hold much better boundaries with them now. They are the reason I am shifting my business in the direction that I'm going in. And they are the reason I am standing before you today. See, we often get swept up in this sense of happiness that comes from maximizing pleasure, short bursts of excitement, and material goods, because that's what consumerism tells us should make us happy. And there's nothing wrong with maximizing pleasure or the pursuit of pleasure, because we need that. But we need so much more than that. We need a sense of contentment, fulfillment, purpose. We need something that fuels us, a sense of happiness that is deep within us. And that starts when we take care of our energy, our use of time, and our inner peace. Thank you so much for having me today.